they've met. Uh, what are you expecting? What should we expect? Mm. <laughs> well, um, I'm hoping it was going to be an epic match, number one. I mean, why not? The semi-finals was um, with uh, Dimitrov and, and, uh, and um, Nadal was unbelievable. Federer was an amazing match. I, I, I'm going for Rafa. But I'm a little bit concerned only because of, of the amount of time he spent in his five-hour match with Dimitrov. If, if, if this was Rafa four or five years ago when he was used to playing these mm. matches, I would have said, oh, 24 hours to him. Or yeah, it's about that rest difference. time, isn't but it? But it's that yeah. rest time now when he's not been used to it with all the injuries. It could play a factor. Mm. It's like the old guard are back again, in a way, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it's like turning time back because we've had these, you know, over the last couple of years, these fantastic players emerging to kind of take over from them. And here we have these two old stages again. <laughs> and I was saying earlier, Roger is Roger because of Rafa, and Rafa is Rafa because of Roger. They mm. almost need each other somehow, don't they? Yeah, well, well it's a great rivalry. I mean, uh, and I noticed the other day, actually, Federer sort of put something out when he was on the TV doing the interview afterwards saying, well, you know, my record with, with Rafa, a lot of times I played him on clay earlier on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and so that was the reason, you know, I didn't know how to quite play him in those days. But now, so in other words, he's saying sort of, wipe out those clay court matches oh. that we played in the past. But their, oh, their, their rivalry is unbelievable. Well, they don't count, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So let's look at the stats. So if you look at uh, Nadal winning 23 of those mm. 35 matches that they've had together. So, uh, so the odds are on his side if you look purely at the numbers. But right. there's a lot else that will, will, will figure in this. Well, I mean, they know each other so well. I mean, their, their games... Uh, the thing to me is the court surface is very quick this mm -hmm. year at the yep. Australian Open, and, and it, it plays into both their hands. Federer is obviously because he can end the points a bit quicker, but, but also with Rafa, he gets that forehand up nice and high. The ball jumps off, his, off, the, off the court and gets up high to Federer's backhand, which has been the weakness in the past. But Federer's been working on that and seems to be hitting the ball pretty well on that side, so it's going to be an interesting battle. I just think, to me, Rafa is looking like he did four or five years ago well, well. and I, I honestly to be honest didn't think that was going to happen again there was a time wasn't there when you wouldn't have thought he would come back to that level no well his injuries yeah, yeah. Um, Andy Murray sitting somewhere I'm not sure where whether it's at <laughs> home or somewhere warm watching this do you think he will watch this thinking this was my chance well, it was a huge opportunity. I mean, let's face it, at the beginning of the two weeks, we all thought it was going to be either Andy Murray or Djokovic, and Andy was the favourite. I think last year took a lot more of a toll than we thought, and I think even though he came in pretty eager, I think in the end, what he did last year was a ridiculous year. I mean, and I think it just took its toll on him, and he was exhausted. We'll see the best of Andy Murray as the year gets on. He needs a little bit of break to recharge the batteries. And we talk a lot, don't we, about the, 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 the time that he spends in Miami you know, doing the extra fitness work and the extra training. But actually, I think this year that was condensed down to even shorter than it normally is. It was maybe a fortnight. And those days are so intense. Never mind the season he's just played and everything that's been happening. The training at that point is beyond. It's another level, isn't it? Oh, he's a warrior. I mean, but you have to be a warrior at the top. I mean, the, the training they do these days, it's, it's beyond belief. I mean, it's frightening. I, I watch them on court and you see the athleticism that they have and, and what it's doing to their bodies and you, it's quite amazing. But Andy, I think, he, he actually just needs to sit on the beach for a couple of weeks, I think, and re <laughs> literally just sort of relax because, uh, you know, you never know what a year like he had last year does on you and, and you could see he was tired during the Australian Open. How do you psychologically prepare for a match like, like the one today? Well, I mean, I think they've been there, done it so many times. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it certainly helps when you've got people in your camp that have been there as well. And, and Rafa Nadal now has got Carlos Moya, who was a number one in the world. And, and uh, Roger Federer has got Lupacic, who was number two in the world. So you have these little conversations. It's more just about... But you, you know what the funny thing is? People don't believe this when, when I tell them that even the great players get nervous before a final. They walk on court and they look so relaxed like they're just going out for a stroll in the park. But believe me, they're nervous. So it's the night before. It's, it's just psychologically just talking about things that might happen. And in those moments before they go out on court, the, in the Australian Open, would they share a dressing room or would they be in separate rooms? How would that work? They will share a dressing room, but they'll be the other sides of the dressing room. So they'll have their, they'll, they'll, their group on one side and the other group on the other, and they'll be, they'll be sort of nice and, how are you this morning and all that, and good luck, not. Oh. <laughs> and, then, and then they'll go at it. Yeah. So predictions? How I'm, I'm going for Rafa, yep. um, but I'm going to give myself an out to say that match may have taken a lot of toll on him in the semi-finals, but uh -huh. I'm going, going for Rafa. I'll go for Roger then. Yeah. OK. I'll we're covered then, aren't we? That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you really. go for a draw. Go on, try OK, that. cool. Right, I'm straight down the middle. Okay. <laughs> really nice to see you. Nice Thanks see for coming in. And you can hear live commentary on BBC Radio 5 Live from 8.30 this morning. TV highlights are on BBC 2.
from one o'clock. Yeah, let's check in on what the weather is doing this morning. Chris has got the details. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ben. Hi, Sally. Very good morning to you. We had a big hailstorm last night go through Cumbria, leaving scenes like this in Whitehaven. The reports of a centimetre or two of hail covering the roads and pavements in this part of the world. And that hailstorm, well, it came in off the Irish Sea. It's just this one working across on the radar picture. For the time being, we've got a number of showers showing up with a more persistent area of rain just beginning to make inroads in across the far west of Cornwall. And uh, one thing I should mention is there is a risk of ice up and down the country with temperatures below zero, especially where we've seen those showers overnight. Just bear that in mind, the roads could be quite slippy this morning. As the morning goes by, we'll see more persistent rain getting into southern Wales, southwest England. But there's a bit of uncertainty how far northeast this rain band gets. It might be that across parts of the East Midlands, maybe even parts of uh, southeast England, that we don't really see the rain until after dark. So a bit of uncertainty about that. Rain should reach Northern Ireland for a time around the middle part of the day. The far north of England and Scotland, it's more straightforward. We've got sunshine, a few showers, quite cool. Temperatures four to six Celsius. Rain clears away from Shetland to leave some blustery showers for the Northern Isles too. And overnight, again, it turns icy where we see those skies clear across the north of the UK. A lot of cloud further south for England, Wales, Northern Ireland, keeping the frost at bay with some mist and hill fog patches, some dampness in the air as well, compared with those colder temperatures that we have further northwards and eastwards. Now, looking at the weather in the week ahead, it is going to be an unsettled week. That's something we're not seeing for quite a few weeks. Spells of rain becoming windy, perhaps with severe gales later in the week, but it will tend to be on the mild side. So Monday starts off like this. A lot of clouds, some mist and hill fog patches, a bit of damp, drizzly weather, patchy rain working in through the afternoon. Across Scotland, northeast England, that's probably where the best of the sunshine will be. But even here, it will tend to cloud over a little bit through the afternoon. With a cloud cover, mild, 12 degrees towards southwest England, but still quite chilly for Scotland and northeast England. But uh, Ben, Sally, I thought I'd finish with another weather watch picture. The sunrise just up there in Fraserburgh in Aberdeen. What do you think of this? Isn't it beautiful? That's an amazing wake, Chris. Thank you. You've cheered us up because you gave us sleet, hail and all sorts that I call snow earlier. So we, we much prefer that. We'll have more of those, please. Four seasons in one day. What can Thank we say? Thank you. <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Bit of everything. I love it. <laughs> yeah, You're he's watching... delivered for us. He has, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. It is 22 minutes past eight. Let's have a look at today's papers. Well, Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner is here to tell us what's caught her eye in the papers. And uh, good morning to you. Good nice morning, to see you. Um, No surprise, it's all about Trump in many of the papers. Yes, and I feel ambivalent about the fact that there were these conversations with world leaders. First mm. of all, it's brilliant. You know, I'm really happy he spent an hour on the phone to Putin because the more you have conversations, the more hope there is for communication and, and stopping, uh, well, our primary aim is war, mm. stopping killing when we have countries not talking to each other in Cold War. On the other hand, his laws, as we know, that he's already started are very concerning. And it made me think about this particularly because we're in Manchester today mm. and our synagogue in Manchester last night held a choral extravaganza with Christians, Muslims, Jews, people from Hungarian backgrounds that came from local schools. And you think, what's happening on the ground? There's one of our synagogues that is housing a, Syri a Syrian mm -hmm. refugee family. So in Britain, we are still very, very devoted to looking after each other and diversity. How do you think those calls went? Because we know Theresa May criticised for not condemning his stance on immigration, that yes. ban on certain... And refugees, Re exactly. which is different. Um, very. Clearly a lot of calls in one day. Any other world leaders that are prepared to so, seemingly stand up to him, to, to call him out on certain things? Well, I would prefer us not to know. Mm -hmm. At this point, I would love relationships to be built on trust where things that happened on telephone calls for the first time we don't know about. Because if they think everything is going to be fed back, then the real critique and the mm -hmm. real relationships won't happen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm disconcerted by the call with Putin because you're dying to know what was happening. Mm. Maybe not because people are calling him out, but the opposite, that there may be too much agreement. And that is really concerning. Um, let's turn our attention to something entirely different. This is in the Sunday Times. Um, it's a funny story, this, isn't it? Elite kids as deprived as the poorest. So just explain what... So what about here. in Britain as a whole, we're having a terrible explosion in young people's mental health yep. or mental ill health. Absolutely yep. terrible. And this uh, shows that people who come from families where they own, earn over £100,000 are twice as likely children to have mental health problems. So this cuts across class and money. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you, it also means that when you look at people who have money, rather than thinking they're absolutely fine in every way, we know that anxiety, distress, despair affects young people of all ages. Mm. And I think it's, it's an extreme story, but it does say, do not think that money is the only factor out here. The headline perhaps is a little misleading because it's talking about the Labour peer and film producer David Putnam. That's saying right. that children of the super rich are as deprived as the poor or as unhappy. Right. Oh, well, of course, there's a, the word deprived yeah. is, is the wrong word here. Yeah. As disadvantaged. I'm oh, no, but it says, it says deprived. Yeah. Yeah. The headline yeah. says yeah. deprived, which is exactly right. You know, it's a trigger word. But you turn around and go, really? Because if they have food on their table, if they have heating, how on earth they can be deprived? But affected by mental ill health is much more accurate. Well, and the point is, he's saying, look beyond those photos. The yes. real story lies somewhere beyond the photos Absolutely. of the supercars and the nice jewellery and all that sort of thing. And actually, it's about mental health. That's well. right. Although there is a fun... By showing how much wealth you have mm. on social media, that, that in, in itself is a corrosive dynamic for young people. Mm. For everybody, for people who see it and people who, and people who, are, sh who are showing it. Let's whiz on now. We have uh, the next story. We've just been talking about this, the statue of Princess Diana. Right, and it is linked to the last one because, of course, she had mental health problems. We know that. And what, one of the reasons that people loved her and she was called the people's princess is because she said the truth. Mm. She said, I feel down, I, f I have mental health problems. And she, therefore, openly and beautifully empathised with people and reached across the barriers that are set up to say, I am alongside you if you have HIV, if you are mentally ill, I am with you. And that's a beautiful message. And I love the fact they're going to put her statue up and, and they're her kids, so go for it. Uh, let's turn our attention to Mail on Sunday. Uh, doctors told don't refer to expectant mothers. It will upset those who are transgender. Now, the Mail calls it a bizarre ban by the British Medical Association. So I have a, uh, a child, an old child, who is in trans, who is uh, non-gender binary, which means that they don't identify particularly as a male or a female. And from that world, they are saying, don't use this language. Now, as a straight person, I might think, wow, not to call people expectant mothers just sounds over the top. It's not really for me to define. We used to have that discussion about chairman, mm. and I'm very glad that most of the time we use something else, unless it's, it, the person is self-defined male. So we used to think that was extreme. So I think understanding, and it's all linked with mental health, because, of course, young people's mental health, if they come from a, a trans background or a gay background, they're far more vulnerable. So we need to celebrate people from where they come from, and they're saying, this isn't appropriate for us. Mm. But you can understand people's reaction to that headline, which is that if you're not going to call a mother a mother, what are you going to say? Yes, I know, a parent. I mean, people used to talk only about mothering. And I think my husband would find that quite annoying because oh. he is an equal parent. So we parent, we don't mother. And at the beginning, people think, well, look, that's a ridiculous term, parenting. What about all those fantabulous fathers who are just involved, if not more, with parenting? Oh. So at the beginning, when we try and change language to change society, it, it grates and you know, that's just ridiculous, too much. But then, as it manifests itself in social norms, it becomes more sensible. Yeah, it is uh, uh, times against it, but yeah, we should just point out it's only one of the things uh, in the booklet from the BMA. It does yes. sorts of other things as well, but they've <laughs> chosen that one. Uh, they've also said don't use the word surname, use family name because that's uh, uh, male. It's male. So yeah. um, there's just one of many. But the language thing is very, very important. Just even starting with pronouns for people. What on earth do you say? So you say they rather than him and her. That whole gender, bi non-gender binary toilets. Those are very important. We have run out of time, sadly. Okay. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Yeah. It's Thanks lovely to be with you too. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, Rabbi Laura. Thank you. Uh, now, coming up in the next half hour. I had the option of burgundy velvet Ooh, knickerbockers nice. with white tights and mm. uh, white ballet shoes. <laughs> Sounds marvellous. Often named as one of the most stylish men on the planet. Now, David Beckham's revealed he always had an eye for a killer <laughs> outfit. We'll have more before nine o'clock. Yeah, stay with us. The headlines are up next. Somewhere waiting for me. <laughs> My lover stands Hi. on golden sand and watches Hi. the ships oh, yeah. that go sailing somewhere. 
watch your little ones discover CBB's Playtime Island, the app for games with all their CBB's friends. Free to download now. Hello, this is Breakfast with Ben Thompson and Sally Nugent. Uh, coming up before nine, Chris will have a look at the weather for us. But first, at exactly 8.30, let's get a summary of this morning's main news. American civil liberties campaigners have won a partial victory in their challenge to Donald Trump's ban on some people entering the US. The president had ordered that entry be refused to all refugees for 120 days and to citizens of seven particular countries for 90 days. A number of travellers who were in the air when the ban came into force were detained on arrival in the United States. But a federal judge in New York said that visitors who'd set off with valid visas should not be deported. Downing Street says Theresa May does not agree with Donald Trump's refugee ban and will appeal to the US if it affects British citizens. Prime Minister was criticised for refusing to condemn the president's executive order on Saturday. At an earlier news conference in Turkey, Mrs May said it was up to the US to decide its own policy. Her refusal to openly challenge the ban had prompted criticism from politicians, including her own Conservative MPs. A statue of Princess Diana has been commissioned by her sons, the Duke of Cambridge and Prince Harry. They will help pay for the sculpture, which will be placed in the grounds of her former home, Kensington Palace in London. The princess said that 20 years after her death, the time was right to recognise their mother's positive impact around the world. Living standards could be set to fall this year, according to a report by a leading think tank. Research organisation the Resolution Foundation says that a mini-boom in living standards between 2014 and 2016 has now ended. They warn that household incomes are now growing at their slowest rate since 2013 and rising inflation and stagnant wages lower living standards across the UK. Wildfires in Chile are now known to have killed at least 11 people and left several thousand homeless. Firefighters and volunteers are tackling more than 100 separate fires, half of which are still out of control. The authorities have detained more than 20 people suspected of arson. Now, it is one of the most colourful events in the calendar, and yesterday people all over the world celebrated the start of the Chinese New Year. Yeah, in Hong Kong, as you can see, thousands took to the streets to watch the parades. Now, many of the 3,000 performers wore gold, yellow and brown. They're considered to be lucky colours in the year of the rooster. Well, the festival also marked the 20th anniversary of the handover of the territory from British rule back to China. Looks like a good party, isn't it? It does. There's a lot of people there. <laughs> It is 8.32. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. Time to get some sports news now. I know the tennis is about to start any moment now. That's right. We're keeping a tight eye on yeah. over here in yeah. the corner. It's just about to kick off. But before we talk about that, Carl Frampton, where did it go wrong? We were about halfway through, I think. <laughs> about, yeah, about the seventh round, yeah. I reckon. We started to get an idea then that maybe he wasn't going to retain his featherweight title. So sadly, those 5,000 Irish fans who are out there will be commiserating. But I reckon they're still going to have a party anyway. In Vegas, yeah, maybe. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> I think they'll manage it. Yeah. Good morning. Carl Frampton has suffered the first defeat of his professional career after 12 gruelling rounds at the MGM in Las Vegas. Leo Santa Cruz is the new WBA featherweight champion. This, of course, was the Northern Irishman's first defence of the title, when she won narrowly against Santa Cruz in July. But this time round, it was the Mexican who edged it, winning with a majority points decision and ending Frampton's unbeaten record. Afterwards, Frampton admitted the better man won, saying his opponent probably deserved it, and even alluded to a third and final fight, possibly in Belfast. There are plenty of shocks in the fourth round of the FA Cup. Wolves claim the biggest scalp, knocking out Liverpool, while non-league Lincoln City will be in the last 16 for the first time since way back in 1902. And there could have been more, as Patrick Geary reports. It's the salute of the underdog, a clap first performed by Iceland at last summer's Euros, whose upstart example Wolverhampton Wanderers followed gloriously. Opponents Liverpool had made nine changes and were just getting acquainted with each other when Richard Stearman headed Wolves ahead, 53 seconds in. Later in the half, the championship side sprung again. All it needed was Andreas Weimann to stay calm, then composure could go out the window. Liverpool got one back, but still went...